What up, though? <laughs> my God. Good to see you, brother. Yes, sir. What's up? What's up? What's up? What's up? Respect, good, man. Yeah. Yes, sir. Where they going? You good, baby? What up? What's oh, good? Love. Yes, sir. All right. I am on the pivot. <laughs> <laughs> Outside. I mean, I mean, it's really cool. You know, you get, you make friends in this business. We've made friends. Uh, Happy Dad is obviously a, a sponsor of ours. Um, we were talking earlier, though, Ryan. Um, about the fact, which I think is really cool, and because we have the same name, I'm actually a less happier dad that you figured out something I didn't. You got two girls, and you actually named one of them Ryan, which was like I super did. dope. But now that you've moved into this world and you've retired, like what's life with like two young ladies growing up in the house? Uh, it's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot, but I try to be present, right? Like I. I make my kids breakfast and lunch every day, and then I drop them off at school every day, right? Bus driver. And yeah, exactly. You know, particularly in this environment, you know, raising little black girls to be strong black women, like, that's, that's really important to me. And so, mm -hmm. but I gotta give you your flowers, bro, because your family unit always inspired me, man. Uh, as a young man who didn't know left from right coming into the league, I looked at you as a major role model on just, like, how to be a great pro, first and foremost, but how to be a good man. And so I thank you for that, bro. Appreciate you, that, man. man. Yeah. See? You ain't worth a f. <laughs> <laughs> hey. I love that, Hey. Limitless. Take a simic cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. On the mission, get me up. Knowing me, I got the key. On the vision, I can trust. Trust. Limitless. Take a simic cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. On the mission, get me up. Well, man, this is the pivot. Uh, obviously, we got Channing, Fred, uh, Ryan Mundy is, is our guest today. Uh, first of all, we want you to subscribe and like, right? Whether it's YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all of those things are important. We thank our sponsor, Happy Dad. Uh, we've also now partnered with Prize Pick, and then we have our own promo code, right? <laughs> Pivot, and they will Prize Picks will match up to a hundred okay. dollar for dollar on your first deposit, up to a hundred dollars okay. cap. Also, too, can we tell the people how much better I've been at this? Than you, you went five for five one time. You you hit them in the head. Yeah. I give you love when you hit them in the head. Right, we just yeah, we just had, hit them in the head. It's Freddy. the conference finals. We just had all the deep on. I mean, I feel yes. like I feel like what I said the first night when we first announced this is actually true. I'm so much better at it than both of y'all. No, you're not. <laughs> he's not. Bro, he's not. Prove it. He think because he sit up on ESPN and that goofy ass shit he wears with his bow ties <laughs> that you're better than me at basketball. You, I know basketball and I know the heat and I know what's going on. It's a thing about this black and yellow prize picks. I don't know what they were doing, but you feel at home. That don't give you an easy out. What we do, though, is prize picks wouldn't have picked Jaguars colors. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that says loser. That, that is a fact. That's a fact. That is a fact. 100%. That's a fact. That's a fact. That is a fact. That's a fact. That's a fact. That is a fact. But we are in Florida, right? And it's not only available here, but what? It's 75% it's uh, of the states. Right. That, Florida, Texas, California, the bigger states. Yeah. The bigger states. So, you get a bigger opportunity. Right, to give you opportunity to make good money. And they'll match you up to 100, and you can use our promo code. And I'm hoping that as I continue to win, eventually the promo code just turns into RC. Do you have to put that line in your side of your head? I was trying something different. He in Miami showing off. Man, he's showing out. In 2000, you were 15 or 16 years old. Yeah, yeah, roughly. I used to terrorize, I destroyed the Pittsburgh Steelers. So you gonna start that already? You choosing yeah. violence. You choosing violence. <laughs> Terrorize, destroy, those are strong no, no. words. What I'm those are really is, strong words. I have the most rushing yardage all time against the Steelers in Three River Stadium. So I feel like I broke your heart, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah, a few times. I will say this, bro. Like, For I used sure. to love playing with the Jaguars on Madden. <laughs> I, 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 like I will give you that's how old like, you are, though. I used that's to love so like, like Madden 03, Madden 02 on like PlayStation One. Yeah, like 
facts. Brandy, 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 he was, Brandy, he was the man in 02. In 02. In 02. See, but that's what I was talking to the kids about at the camp, though. The superstar Madden 22 or whatever. It's like, yeah, you're my special player. I say, see, you're my homeboy. You know what I'm saying? So, so they got special players now. Like a and, super. Like, so you can go back I, and get I used old, to be the dog dudes. in Madden, man. I don't even understand it now. But I'm one of those good guys. Well, You'll probably never be there, but... I, I won't. Listen, hey, Fre <laughs> Freddie T... They ain't put my name on my jersey. Yeah, hey, here's the thing, though. <laughs> Freddie T talks about his NFL career like we all don't say the same things about him. You know, like, you, you come in here and you tell us, you know, all these things you've done and you point all this stuff out. We all knew you were a dog. Like, it we ain't never had a problem that. with it that. It ain't about you. It's not about Chan. It's about company. Oh, so you got to make sure a company knows, like, You're right out, out the You feel at home yeah. now, right? Yeah. You got to break the ice. I guess you can put it that way. You got to break the ice, and we're, we're good so to go. So, you know, that's like, that's like you, you, you're having, like, a cookout, or you're welcoming somebody into your home, and as soon as they get there, you're like, hey, man, your outfit sucks. I firmly, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I firmly <laughs> believe in, if I can't F with you, I don't F with you. That's okay. what that's no, what that's I believe fair. in. Well, so I appreciate you, no, bro. No, that's, well, no, that's so now we will pivot from Freddie Flowers yeah. Giving himself flowers. So, yeah. But this show, for us, and, and it was really cool. Um, like I said, I played with Monday. Um, he was one of those dudes, like, as soon as he got to the team, you knew he was different. Uh, we had an opportunity to do uh, a show with uh, Myron Rowe recently, and he was one of those guys, when, when, when you're sitting down with him, you know, okay, this dude's different from what you normally see in the locker room. From the time he walked into our building, you know what I mean? Some people called him Wonderlick. You know what I mean? Like, all those things. Just not that, <laughs> yeah. They called you Wonderlick? They called me Wonderlick, bro. So, like, the backstory behind that is um, I didn't go to any, um, like, all-star games. I didn't go to the combine. All I had was my pro day. And I knocked my pro day out, and then teams became really interested in me. And then so I went to the Steelers facility there, brought me in for a visit, and nobody had a Wonderlick score on me. And so at every visit that I had to go to, I had to go take the Wonderlick. And so I'm sitting down at the UPMC complex. I go in there, one of the scouts says, here, take this Wonderlick. And I knew it, the thing about the Wonderlick is you didn't have to answer every question. Yeah. You just had to, you know, complete as many questions as you could within that allotted time frame. And you could skip questions. And so I was like, oh, okay, I'm only gonna answer the questions that I know the answer to. And so within that 12 minute period, I answered 29 questions and I got 29 questions right. <laughs> and then, so the, the scout came in, and I didn't know it at the time, but he was like, dude, are you some type of genius or something? I was like, no, why? He's like, well, you just got all your questions right. I was like, oh, okay, cool. Right? <laughs> like, but then when I got drafted by the Steelers, that's what uh, Coach Tomlin called me day one. He was like, what's up, Wonderlick? And I was like, oh, all right, cool. I'll rock with that. I'll definitely rock with that. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things, too. You know, it, it's so crazy, and, and we've talked about it and we know that, like sometimes people look at that as a negative, mm -hmm. right. right? Like it's, it's, right. It, it almost becomes a joke or an insult. Right. But like that was the cool thing about our room was like once you got to know him, like you realize he was really intelligent, but he was also um, no. about, about ball. Like he, he you know, he, he played hard, he worked hard, he hit. And like that, and that was always like the, the cool thing about being around him. But really when he reached out to me, he's like, hey man, are y'all gonna do anything on mental health this month. And I was like, yeah, we would love to. And so I think it's really cool that he can now talk about how you transitioned from being a football player and some of the things that you've gone through and you went through to now being focused on mental health with your new company. And so if you could, before we even start, kind of explain to people now what you're doing. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate that, bro. Um, you know, what I'm up to now, I started a company called Alchemy Health. And basically, uh, it is a mental health company uh, that creates video uh, and audio and live stream well-being content through the lens of like the black experience. The quick backstory on that is after my eight year career, um, you know, and we all kind of faced that transition. I was trying to figure out like who and what am I when I'm no longer tackling somebody. And I went into the marketplace to quote, go see a therapist and had a really, really rough time at it. And I found that to be like pretty difficult and disappointing because I knew how to take care of my knee, I knew how to take care of my shoulder, my back, et cetera, but I didn't know how to take care of my mind. And I didn't have like the help and support and the resources to like better understand that for like the next phase of my life. And I thought that that was like really troubling. And so I was like, okay, well, like 
if nobody's doing anything about this and I'm going through what I'm going through and I have the privilege to have like resources available to me, then what's happening on like the south and west side of Chicago, the north side of Pittsburgh, the east side of Detroit. And professionally, like I had exposure to like the startup ecosystem, how to create businesses, funding, et cetera. So I just kind of put two and two together and I said, this is a massive opportunity to go out into the world and make a difference. Um, and just combine my experiences and just got off to the races. And with the mental health thing, like, the stigmas behind it, yeah. the taboos behind it. Yeah. Like we've talked about it before, where like, in, 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 a, in a, I say, in a black household as a kid, you don't talk about you're it. depressed. Yeah, can't afford that. Go to bed. Yeah. Right, right, right. You know what I'm saying? You're stressed. You're stressed out. Yeah. Go to bed. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. And from there, like, how how do we change that? Like, as, as you're stu as you're looking into it, and as you're trying to figure it out, how do we change that taboo of the mental health side of things. Yeah, I think it starts with like conversation and also education, right? Like we didn't even know better to like say anything different, right? Outside of like the stigma, we need to know how to like care for ourselves better mentally. We didn't know how, right? And so like we took a big step back at, at, at Alchemy and said like, yeah, it's really, it's a really easy statement to say, go see a therapist, but there's a ton of access barriers that prevent you to do so. Right, starting out with like costs. Therapy is very expensive. Like, I don't know about y'all, but like, what what family members of ours can afford $150 per therapy session? Yeah. Right. Geographic constraints, time constraints, and then also like finding a therapist who looks like us really, really matters. But the reality is, is that less than I would say probably four percent of clinical psychologists and therapists are black or of color. So like, when you say like, go see a therapist. It sounds really, really easy to do, but it's very, very difficult. And so with all that in mind, I was like, all right, like how do we kind of like start this journey? We start by providing education, skills, and tools for us to better understand like what mental health means and how can I be proactive on an individual basis. You said when you were seeking a therapist or when you tried to start therapy, you had a rough time. Yeah. What, what did you mean by you had a rough time? Was the actual session difficult? Was it difficult to find someone to work with. What what about that experience prompted you to move into what you were doing, what you're doing now? Yeah, that's a good question, right? It was a it was a multitude of things. Uh, during that time, like I was physically hurt, right? So that 2015 season, uh, I had back surgery. And so I was on IR the entire year. And a new coaching staff had come in, new management had come in, and it wasn't really rocking with me. In the previous year, uh, 2014, I had my best year ever as a pro. Like, I was out there balling. Was that in New York? Or that was in that Chicago. Was Chicago okay. Yeah, that yep. was in Chicago. The new staff came in, they were looking to clean house. I wasn't their guy, and they was trying to get rid of me, right? And it just so happens, uh, like, bad luck or good luck, depending on how you looked at it, I got hurt, and I was on IR that whole season. And so I'm sitting on the couch, I'm emotionally hurt, and that's where I started to, like, mentally check out and say, man, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. And so I'm wavering back and forth in my heart and in my mind, like, man, I've I've played football my entire life, and now I'm at getting to this inflection point of like, what am I going to do next? And leading up into that point, you know, I was doing all this educational work, getting my MBA, et cetera, uh, but it's a lot different trying to put the rubber to the road. And so I knew I needed help. And so I'm like, look, I can't figure this out on my own. I need to go see somebody. And when I got into those rooms and when I was seeing somebody, uh, I'll, I'll be straight up honest with you, man, it was pretty bad, right? Like, they were asking me, you know, like how much money are you gonna make? And yeah, like exactly. How much money you're gonna make post career? No, that season, right? Like as if that was going to be the driver of why I was gonna go back and play football, right? Like I'm like, man, it's bigger than that. Like I don't need money, right? I'm trying to figure out like what is driving me internally, right? And this guy, he's asked me about like how much money I'm gonna make and, and uh, you know, like what are my career prospects? I'm like, bro, like I'm really trying to work through this and I don't think that that's the appropriate question that you need to be asking me to help me figure out who I am, right? So like it was that and then it was also like my family was going through a laundry list of like chronic disease and illness. Uh, my father-in-law passed away from a heart attack uh, a little bit after that. My grandfather had got diagnosed with Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, my mom was going through some health issues as well. So I saw all these things kind of happening and then I just had like this light bulb go off. I was like, look, man, I'm going through what I'm going through. My family is going through what they're going through. Like who is principally focused on like the, traje the uh, trajectory of black health, right? Like nobody. And I was like, all right, well, I'll do something about it. And so that's how I got, it. That's how I got started. But specifically as it relates to that, that therapy experience, it was pretty rough, man. And that's where I realized that regardless of my resources, regardless of like what I'm able to accumulate, like at the end of the day, like, Cultural competency matters, understanding matters, and people seeing you for like who you really are really matters too. 
when you say cultural competency, right? Yeah. Social media in, in our younger generation. You know, how does social media influence, you know, their thought processes, you know, and can that trigger depression, you know, rumination or anything where they feel that they're not capable or, you know, uh, good enough to do things that other kids their ages and people in society are doing. Yeah, I think that's a big driver of it too, right? We, uh, we see a lot of uh, instances on, on social, whether that be bullying or like you feel like you have to measure up to somebody or their version of success and what they're displaying on social media. But the reality is everybody's always primarily talking about the good stuff in their lives on social media. So it right. kind of creates like this false reality uh, if you will, it's like, oh man, I don't have the watch, or I don't have the car, or I don't have the latest shoes, and you feel like you're less than. Uh, and if, you know, the way that these platforms and technology is designed, like we just scroll, 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 mm -hmm. scroll, wake up, go on Instagram, go to sleep, we on Instagram, right? So it's like this constant reminder of like, I'm less than, right? So that feeds into like anxiety, because I feel like I'm less than, at least to depression, because I feel like I'm less than. And so, like, you're just constantly being reminded that you're not good enough by, like, social media. So the algorithms create yeah, a PTSD true. effect yeah, in, in so many ways. Yeah, 100%. I believe so, at least. Within the black community, don't we suffer from a different sort of PTSD yeah. that leads to certain mental depressions? Yeah, I think, you know, just taking, a, like, a huge step back, you know, like, think about how we got here, right? Like, over 400-plus years ago, like, our ancestors were, you know, whipped, beaten, killed, et cetera, and put on ships, you know, for like an inhumane journey. And then when we got here, we were what? Treated like less than for 400 plus years, right? We think about like the healthcare system, we think about like the criminal justice, mm -hmm. criminal justice system, the education system, like all this stuff is des was designed and originated to kind of keep us out of the loop, right? And kind of keep us not growing and prospering. And so like, there's a lot that we have to kind of undo. And that's why like, I designed the company in the way that I designed it, particularly from like a branding perspective, because we got to show up differently, right? Mm -hmm. Like we can't show up like the old school health, uh, uh, healthcare players of, of old because that's not working. And those systems and those companies and those brands weren't designed for us in mind, right? And I tell people all the time, I'm like, we, we start with like design and we're focused on the black community, but the reality is what's good for black people is good for all people, yeah. right? That's the fact of the matter, right? And I, I, I sometimes make the parallel about like the company, we're kind of akin to like rap and hip hop. Like rap, hip hop is about storytelling, it's about like our stories from the hood, the communities, et cetera, but like everybody buys into it and everybody finds themselves into it. And so, you know, taking a differentiated approach and saying with all that context and saying like, look, man, we gotta do things differently because the world is moving in a different place too. And Ryan, Ryan, Freddie, it's funny you bring that up. How do, how do, we, how do we change it? We're all fathers. Yeah. How do we change that? Jim Crow was 1963. You know what I'm saying? Like, less than 70 years ago, we were not equal humans. We were right. cattle. Right. How do we take that PTSD that Freddie's talking about, how do we take that out of our kids? How do we make them feel equal when they walk into every single room? Yeah. And that's what I try to do with my kids. Like, you, when you walk in a room, you're the same as everybody else in there, no matter what, how much money you have, no matter where you come from, no matter what you do. But we have to change that. Our generation, our, our kids' generation, shouldn't feel that way because we know. Right. We know how that feeling is. How do we change do it? Do you think our kids see it the same way we did? See, because like my parents, mm -hmm. like my parents growing up, they drilled that in me. You have to be this much better. If you're going for the same job, if you're in the same classrooms. What's the you, same? Work two times as hard to get half as much. Right, you don't, and, and they would always, and they would always say those things, and even in raising my kids, my kids always went to private schools. Mm -hmm. We always told them, you're just as good as everyone else. And then some things happen in, whether it be high school, uh, you know, now in, in college, especially some things that has gone on with Jordan, where the world has reminded him mm. that, he's, that they don't see it that way. That, that the, the, the fact that we love him so much or we love them so much and think they're so great. And we, I almost felt like because I didn't preach the same things my parents preached, that I, I, I allowed that to shock him, mm -hmm. right? Like I allowed that to, to, to shock my kids because I'm telling them, no, you're just as good, you're just as smart. If, if, you look, if it was a piece of paper that explained who you are, everybody in the world would pick you. Yep. And then the world reminded him, yeah, but that, that skin is still brown, and I still feel a way about that. So do we handicap our kids by not telling them some of the real? 
What I think is whatever you try and do at home with your child, you know, Ryan just mentioned old school. This isn't old school. This isn't what we grew up to know. You know, our, our parents and grandparents, they told us things were like this when I was a child, which is much different than when we were children. And it's a lot more different now with the exposure and the accessibility that they have to social media where they can see other kids doing certain things and they can create a, a Band-Aid. And I don't want to dismiss these kids in this generation by saying that they're not strong enough because mental illness is real. Mm -hmm. You know, what I try not to do is take labels for granted. I don't like labels because I feel like they box you in. You know, but I do respect if someone's going through something because I do know it's, it's, it is real, right? But the, the, the difference is you can be the greatest parent on the planet trying to make sure your kid understands and they, they, they see this, but then when they get to school, we're talking about peer influence. Not necessarily peer pressure, but it's peer influence. You have other kids that are in their ears constantly saying, you know, um, if I can't smoke this blunt in high school, if I can't smoke this blunt, I'm depressed mm -hmm. or I got anxiety. So it's, you got a parent twice as much in order to try and, you know, take away from what they're getting at school because they're not just getting it from one person or two people. It's five, six, you know, seven kids in their ear constantly. So I think that as parents, we just have to use our approach and parent, pray, and leave it to the man upstairs mm -hmm. and, and hope that the outcome, you know, it, is of good more so than on the other side. Do you think, you know, you mentioned in that, and this is a question, you know, I wanted to ask Ryan as well. We have now, especially in our community, done, done a lot of work to make people aware mm -hmm. of the mental health of our communities, of people that look like us. We've done a job of trying to take away those stigmas. And I feel like in that, we've had to undo years of, of bad stigmas, right? The, the fact you say, go to bed if, if you're depressed and this and that. Right. Do you kind of feel though that the awareness we have created, right? Making sure we put a focus on mental health how has that affected the way that kids or the way that young African Americans see mental health or sometimes use it as a crutch, right? Because I know even on TV, it's like something happens and they're like, well, you can't really speak about it because we don't know what he's going through. And I'm like, well, shoot, I just feel like he just made a bad decision, mm. right? Doesn't necessarily have to be mental health. Has our focus on making people aware of it in some way become a detriment to us? I think that's a good question, right? There's a lot to kind of unpack there, and I think I'll, I'll approach it in, in two segments, right? Because what you talked about, your kids being in private school and like the exposure and like there are circumstances where like, hey, you still reminded of this. Uh, that's something that I think about a lot, right? And as I think kids now, particularly kids of color and, and black kids, like we're growing up in an environment and in society like where information is available, mm -hmm. Uh, we could see a lot more, we're exposed to a lot more at a lot younger age, right? Like my kids are on YouTube, they know how to work technology, they're mm -hmm. eight and 10, and I'm like, you know, little tech wizards. I'm like, you know, when I was eight and 10, I was out there, you know, playing tackle football, yeah. snotty nose, the whole night, right? And they're not necessarily aware of like the context all the time around like what it means to be black in America, right? Mm -hmm. I think we're moving, we're making some progress, but obviously, like, we have a lot of historical context that I think generations moving forward may not have, right? And that's the reality of it. And so, like, in those circumstances where you do get reminded of, hey, like, I think that's really important. And it, tying that line back to, like, mental health, that could be a jarring experience. Yes. Right? Because you grow up thinking that you're on equal footing, you're on equal plane, and you're like, oh, like, that happened, right? Like, that's a, that's a trigger for, you know, for you to think about and can you know, significantly impact like, the way you move forward in life. And that's something that I think about a lot. Now, as it relates to um, you know, the, the cop-out, per se, it's really, really hard to, to quantify that or yeah. really speak to that, right? And I think a lot around like, particularly some of the athletes who have come out and been vocal about like, their mental health experiences uh, and struggles, right? And from my two cents, or from my lens, I don't always see it as like 
equal treatment, right? Like, you know, some athletes get treated a certain way because they talk about mental health and other athletes get praised because they talk about mental health, right? It's not delivered or looked at in the same context. And so, yes, some decisions are poor. Yes, some decisions are bad, but ultimately, we could draw a line back and say that like, well, maybe you made that decision because you were depressed. Maybe you made that decision because you were dealing with anxiety because that's what happens in the real world, right? Like think about some people with chronic conditions. How could you expect, uh, you know, an individual with type two diabetes to adhere to like a healthy diet uh, and limit the junk food if they're dealing with depression or if they're dealing with stress or they're dealing with anxiety, mm -hmm. that's coping. Right? And then you're like, well, how could you make that decision? You know you got type 2 diabetes, but you're still eating junk food, right? Like, that's a mental thing, right? And so, like, I think mental health is, is really, really hard to quantify and, and understand, like, how, like, people, the, the level of which uh, your mental health issue is, right? Like, it could be extreme, it could be a small issue. Like, we don't always know, but somebody, we're, we're generally saying that, hey, like, I'm going through some mental health struggles, but it's really, really hard to quantify that. It's not like an ACL tear where it's like, hey, like, you know, like, oh, you tear your ACL, you should be better in 12 months. Like, you can't say that about mental health, right? So I think we're in a new frontier. Everybody's learning, everybody's understanding, but we got a really long way to go. Speaking about that, man, I think of Calvin Ridley, who was mm. missing games because he said, he, you know, yeah. mental illness, you got to take your ass to work, Ryan. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? There's bus drivers, there's dentists, there's, you know, doctors, there's uh, the lady at the gas station. You going through something in life, you got to take your ass to work. So you're saying it's a Band-Aid? Like, that's my whole thing. I don't know, even, and it's funny, and it's two different conversations, but the mental, mental, mental health and the CTE stuff, yeah. I think some people take advantage of it, and it's almost that crutch you were talking about. Yeah. Like, how do we figure out if this dude is lazy or if this dude's really going through something like wh where do you with with uh alchemy like what do y'all have a way to figure that out if it what's going on there because i think some dudes just use it oh cte i got cte i joke about it if i forget somebody's birthday bro <laughs> my sister hey. my sister's birthday just went past i forgot it yeah you know i, I uh, cte <laughs> and i just joke about it but like but a deeper conversation like, i think some people use it as only you words. would joke oh, about yeah. that cte yeah all my towels built up <laughs> I mean, the reality is, like, even with CTE, we don't know, yep. right? Like, CTE is diagnosed post-mortem. So you don't know, you're not officially diagnosed with CTE until you're dead. Even when you're alive, again, like, it's really hard to quantify, like, where you are in the spectrum. Like, how bad is your anxiety or how bad is your stress level or how bad is your depression? Like, there's measurements and, like, tests you could take, but, like, they're highly subjective, right, depending on how you feel during the day. And even to your point around like bus drivers and even, you know, frontline workers, like they have a lot of protections and sometimes they, you know, they, they, um, they have the ability to like say like, yeah, I'm not feeling myself, right? Or I'm not feeling like the best and highest version of myself. And we don't always hold them, I, I won't say hold them to the same standard, but it's looked at in a different light, right? But because we're athletes, we've always been conditioned to what? Suck it up, tough it out, yeah. right? And even furthermore, I would ask you like, you know, do you have that same energy or approach to Naomi Osaka or Simone Biles as you do to Calvin Ridley, right? They yeah. talk about mental health as well. Mm -hmm. Naomi Osaka withdrew from the French Open. Yep. Simone, Simone Biles Olympics. Uh, stepped away from the Olympics, right? But you're talking about Calvin Ridley who stepped away from a few NFL, regular season NFL games, right? So that's what I was talking about earlier around like, we don't really, if we don't know, we have to treat, the, uh, treat everybody with the same respect and understanding and saying like, look, I don't know exactly how bad you're going through what you're going through, but you have acknowledged the need, right? And until we have like the, the right measurements, the information and the ability to, to better understand that, you know, we just kind of have to treat it as such. You know, you asked the question about uh, Naomi and Simone, right? And even Calvin, you know, it, I, I think it all goes back to you know, how you were brought up, yeah. right? The era, those generations. You know, they taught us growing up, even our parents, we gotta be tough. Yep. This is what they think of you, you gotta be tough. And then you take it a step further. You know, we've been playing ball since we were eight, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. Our coaches, our mom, you know, you gotta be tough, don't let him outdo you. Mm -hmm. Tough, 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 everything was tough. We're just in an environment though that, again, there's, in this, I say this very, I understand it's very sensitive uh, subject, 
and I say this with all due respect to anyone that's suffering from mental illness, mental disease, or whatever it may be, um, but we're in an environment where there is copycat. Mm. There's a whole lot of copycat, you know, uh, situations going on. And I think that the easy out is to say mental, you know, I suffer from some sort of mental uh, uh, illness central situation or whatever. So I, I think as it relates to those two young women, um, they, they were going through something dramatic and, and tough, you know. Uh, but Freddie, but, Freddie, but what they Freddie. Were, no, you listen, grew up in I the muck, Freddie. I know. You so grew up I'm in the different. muck. We know your story. You grew I'm up. Different. You got through rough times. I push. Like, I push. It's going to be, it's so gonna it's be easy, rough times in your but life. But it's easy like, for me to I say. Respect mental, I respect the mental illness. Like, I respect that. But life is not easy. Yeah. Everybody's, the, the, everything's not going to be laid out on a silver platter yeah, for nobody. Freddie, like, not for you, not yeah, for yeah, me, not that. for RC, not for Monday. It, it wasn't laid it out, but we worked through it. It all goes back to certain circumstances. I was cut from a different cloth. So I was taught, looking at my grandmother go to work every morning at 4 a.m. to work in the fields, come home at 8 p.m. We barely got stuff to eat. I'm the big, you know, I'm the oldest, so I got to take care of my younger brothers and sisters, four or five of them. It taught me how to be strong. Not everybody has to experience that. So for me, I would say I was cut from a different cloth. I hate labels, even with my children, right? They go to school, the kids, the, the teachers, ADHD, 501 plan, this plan, that plan. We got to get them in this. I'm like, come on, don't box them in. I don't like labels. A lot of times for me, I think labels are band-aids, but I also have to be cognizant and respectful of what everybody's going through because we're all different. Right. This is a whole new generation. I'm 30 years removed from my teenage years. You know what I'm saying? So I respect that. I don't always understand it, but, but that I deal isn't, with But it. isn't that where we are though? Because like I can be honest with you and especially being in the media and having these things happen, you know, Simone Biles, Naomi Osaka. And there's a lot of times that <clears throat> I'm sitting on the outside and I'm watching other colleagues or other media members reach out to these people via social media and say, you're so strong, you know, yeah. thank you for standing up and backing them. And I sit in my house and I'm like, do I need to send that tweet? Right? Do, right. do I need to show that I understand this when I don't? Right, like because it didn't matter how I woke up on Sunday, what I felt, what was going on in my life, to be able to make a call and say, you know what, y'all, I'm just really not feeling it today, never crossed my mind, right. right? Because it was never something that I felt was okay. It wasn't a way that I was raised, right? And so, like, I make fun of my kids all the time because, you know, they listen to, like, all of these different rappers who I don't know. Everybody's a Lil and this and that, right? I don't know them, but <laughs> all the Lil's, all the right? Lils, yeah. But but in every song, you know, like she was, you know, my daughter was, I can't even remember the rapper's name, Trippy Red, right? She was like, yeah, he's like, yeah, Coy LeRae dumped him and he gave, he gave us a great album. It's so good that Coy, I, I don't like her now, but like it's a great rappers. album, right? Because yeah. he was basically like depressed the whole album. Yeah. And he was talking about taking pills and like how sad he was and stupid Ryan, Right, 42-year-old Ryan was like, won't he just get a new girlfriend? Right, because like, that's how I see it, right? But then, but for these kids, it's okay to, to take the pills. It's okay to contemplate suicide. You watch 13 Reasons, what is it, 13 Reasons Why, whatever the show is where the girl commits suicide, and every time I walked in front of the TV, she was basically tormenting the people that pushed her to do that. But the truth is, if you make that decision, you don't get to come back and torment the people. You're gone. And so now, the, whether it's media, social media, whatever it is, as we, as we push these things and we want people to focus on these things, I also think we can plant ideas. We've had two young black girls in the last two years, uh, one in college recently from Southern University, she posts her suicide note on social media. And she jumps off the same bridge a girl jumped off last year mm. and when they couldn't find her. You know, and so I just, I struggle being that, um, sympathetic, uh, being that person that, that understands because of how I was raised, you know? And, but you can't be on front street with that. So Monday is, Monday, is there a balance, right, between people who truly understand and people that push back? 
Like, how can those people come together, have conversations? Because I believe there's validity in both sides that can help in many ways. Yeah, I think so. Um, right, like, this is a whole new conversation, right? You think back to maybe even five years ago, like, nobody was talking about mental health, particularly in the world of, like, entertainment or athletics, right? So I think we need to just continue to move forward with a level of, like, empathy. And you may not understand, but you got to respect it. Right, like you have to say, like, look, I, I can't relate. That's not how I was. That's not how I was raised. But I hear you, right? And if you're articulating this need, then there's obviously because I don't think people are just like doing it for fun, right? Like people are really going through yeah. some things. There's a there's a line, I think, that needs to be understood where it's like we don't necessarily need to glorify these things, right? But we do need to like communicate and make sure that people are understanding like you're not in it alone, right? Because the reality is and there's like this tagline out there, it's okay not to be okay, right? And a lot of times like we feel like we're alone, we feel like there's nobody else that can understand what we're going through and it's conversations like that and maybe sometimes responses like, like that where it's like, well, if I do say something and nobody's gonna believe me, nobody's gonna hear me or nothing's going to change or happen, right? So I, I just think ultimately like conversations, awareness, and helping to continue to decrease the stigma really goes a, a long way for, for individuals who are suffering in silence, who don't know where to go, who don't have uh, like resources or know where to go to get help. I do think that, and we talk about this too, around like, you know, that's not how I was raised. Sometimes that could be a cop out, right? Like, you know, I wasn't raised a lot of, a lot of different ways, right? But now I use those practices in parenting my children and how I lead, lead my life, right? My parents weren't always 100% on the mark. You know what I mean? There are some things that they sh probably should have taught me, and there are some things that they did teach me that probably weren't the best, right? So, like, we have to understand and navigate those lines and say, like, well, even if I wasn't raised that way, I still have to understand and be reactive and adaptive to the environment and what's happening in the world around me. I just, I'm looking at my phone now. You know what I typed in? Ryan Monday's net worth. <laughs> bro, you a millionaire, bro. <laughs> Like you brought it up where people are like, like no, 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 no. Why you did you did you type that up or did you write did you type his name and then net worth came and up? And net worth you know came like, up on that little list. Like, and I was like, can we when we Google you right I said, now? I said the stupid stuff you said, the first thing that comes up is Channing Crowder's wife. <laughs> right? Like that's the like every everybody. And I don't know. Because every know. everybody's amazed. Right, they be like, like, boy. like I don't know. If it was, I don't know if it's because it was. They think she's they think my wife's blind. Yeah. They think about pre <laughs> teeth chanting. You know what I'm saying? Like pre teeth. But, but I bring that up because of the fact that we we've talked, we said it, and you just said something about it, uh, we talked about it earlier, like the money. Yeah. And that's something that I, I think a lot of people get caught up in is like, yeah. bro, you got money. You Why are you depressed? Mm-hmm. You got money, why are you depressed? Yeah. But once you have money, what, what happens from there? Right. And that's what I really can't, and you probably, you smarter than me. <laughs> like, how, like how, how, do, how can you describe that when people say that, that, that phrase of, you're a millionaire. Yeah. yeah. Why are you so upset? Why are you so depressed? Why do you have anxiety? You got millions of dollars. Yeah, I think it's bigger than that, right? Like, you could say, like, you got money, but money doesn't solve, like, what's in here, right? Like, it could buy you a nice house, it could buy you a nice car, it get you nice clothes, watches, or whatever, but that stuff gets old. And even in life, right, like, and I use it, my, just my personal experience, think about what we all did uh, pursuing our dream to make it to the NFL. Like, you realize that dream, and guess what? It goes by like that. And then when you're done, you're, you're still a relatively young man, and you're like, oh, you know, like, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? How am I finding fulfillment, right? How am I finding purpose, right? That's what matters, and that's what I think really, you know, people are, are striving for. And we too easily try to attach that to money, fame, success, or material things, right? But ultimately, the driver is around, like, man, who am I? Right? And that's, that's what I really think is the biggest question is like, who are you inside? Right? Who are you? How are you? What do you want? And what do you want isn't always materialistic type things. Right? It's like, oh, I want to be healthy. I want to have fun. I want to take care of my family. Right? And, and money can be a part of it, but it can't be the only thing. Because right? there's, there's uh, an infinite amount of dollars available. Right? And when you get to, uh, and, and, and I always say this too, like when you accomplish something, then you look around and you're like, okay, what am I going to do next? Right? It doesn't stop. So it's more so about the journey and not so, not so much about the destination. And so, like, just that mindset in itself 
can kind of shift your framework and saying like, well, there's, there's an infinite amount of money out there, right? So money should not be the thing that I'm trying to peg myself to. I'm trying to uh, peg myself to like self-fulfillment and really understanding who I am, because that's what matters most, right? Like there's always going to be money out there and there's always going to be a way to make a buck. So like what's, what's crazy about that is I grew up in the South. I'm from New Orleans, yeah. Southern Baptist, right? And I'd go to all these different churches and it was all these black people and they would always pretty much preach the afterlife, right? Mm -hmm. They would preach your, your reward is on the other side and all these things. And I felt like our parents and our grandparents had to seek Christ because life here sucked so much, right? So, 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 they, had, so they had to focus on the fact that it was going to be better on the other side. Mm -hmm. But we also watched them not have money. Like Fred talk about his grandmother go to work at, at 4 a.m., get home at 8, and he had to do all of these different things. I think sometimes for me, and uh, Dame Lillard said it, uh, Shaq has said it, they were like, you know what, it, it's not stress, or I'm not sad, because sad or, or stressed is not knowing where your next meal is gonna come from, mm. right? And so then you hear that, and you're like, well, shoot, maybe we shouldn't be stressed, or, or, or maybe we shouldn't be depressed. And that is true, like we've watched our parents, we've watched our grandparents go through these things. How do how do you see or how does your company or how do you want to change the way uh, that we internalize those things, right? Because you have, to, you have to change the way you see those things in order to be accepting of the quote unquote new generation or the way we're trying to move in our communities yeah. to see mental health as something we have to protect and work on constantly. Yeah, I think, you know, you could be thankful and depressed all in the, like those aren't binary propositions, right? Like, so if you have resources, if you are a millionaire, if you're able to like provide and have like nice things in life, you should definitely be thankful, right? But that doesn't mean that you can't deal with stress and managing those things, anxiety of trying to figure out how to get more of those things, whatever it is, or being depressed. You know, so there's a difference between like being thankful and like dealing with like a mental health issue mm -hmm. or like state of mind being or well being, right? And so, I think about it again, like I said, you know, really, and I just, what I described previously was around like this framework of just like how to go along that journey, right? And it starts with like, who am I? Like, who am I internally? And it's not what people say about me, it's not what social media says about me or what my family members say about me, but like, who am I inside? Like, you know, what makes me happy? What drives me? What inspires me, right? Like, that's what really matters. And then it's like, okay, well, how am I? Like, I don't think we have the language to really uh, describe and communicate how we're doing on a daily basis. Like when somebody asks you like, you know, how you doing bro? What do you say? I'm good. good. Right? Always, I'm good. Right, but the fact of the matter is there's this thing out there called the feelings wheel. And basically it's, it's a bunch of different descriptors of like states of being like angry, happy, sad, etc. It's probably around maybe a hundred words. And, and guess what's what? it called again? I'm in what's, what's it called? The feelings wheel. Wheel, like? Yeah, it's w like a wheel. Okay. It's feelings wheel, right? There's like a hundred words to describe how you're feeling on there. And guess what's not on there? Good. <laughs> really? Yeah. I'm good is not a feeling. <laughs> right? So we, <laughs> that's a fact. Yeah. There's, there's almost a hundred words on this feelings wheel and good is not on there. Wow. And I was like, yo, like that's kind of trippy. I'm walking around saying I'm good all the time. And that's not even a feeling. And the fact of the matter is when we do say I'm good, are you really good? Probably not. Exactly. Yeah. Right? So like we walk around and we continue to just like, suppress how we're actually feeling because we don't even have the language to communicate how we're feeling and we're saying the feeling that ain't even on like the feelings wheel, right? So after that, it's like, okay, who am I? How am I? And then it's like, okay, again, like, what do you want? I think that's a really big looming question, but it takes like those two, uh, those two like previous questions to really figure out like what you want out of life, right? And it can't always be the materialistic things. And then the last part is around like, well, who am I becoming? Cause like, we're always evolving, we're always growing on our journey. So we always have to kind of stay in contact and stay in check with like who we're becoming as people. Like, you know, I don't know, how, how old are you? i will be 39 this year. 39 year old Channing is not the same as 18 year old Channing. No, no. 18 year old Channing was a mother. Right, so the, exactly, exactly. So there's so growth. 39 year old. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't changed that much, dog. We, <laughs> we met his mom. But <laughs> that's the end of the story. Right, that's right, it. Bro. That's it. My mom wide open. But 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 no, listen. not not your mom. What she said about you, not your mom. What she say? What did she say? This mother ain't changed since he was in diapers. <laughs> <laughs> 
I would bust a windows of rocks when I was we three years old. We got our core old. characteristics, right? But you ain't doing all the same things, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, he, he's evolved. Yeah. He, he's, he's evolved at but, least but, so. but no, but no, but real talk now, like, as we talk about it, and as I'm hearing it, and it, sound, it sounds good, I understand, I, I'm gathering it, but you're talking about finding, like, happiness, finding what you want in life. Most people, to be honest, bruh, are just trying to get a roof over their head and food in their stomach. Facts. You know what I'm saying? And that's what the money thing where we got bread, like we all got bread, we all, you know what I'm saying, we, yeah. we, get, we eat three meals a day. But when you, when you don't have three meals a day, when you gotta send your kid to school to have, to have the, 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 free, the free breakfast, free lunch, right? then your mind is different, ain't it? Like your mind's different at that point. Yeah. And as we sit here as successful men, we have to really think about the people that aren't yeah. in our situation. 1,000%. You I know what I'm saying? Like, you yeah. feel what I'm saying? Yeah. Where, like, that is, that, there's, there's no anxiety. There's no stress. There's, I have to put food on my table tonight. That's my goal. Right. Is to get some meat and some vegetables to feed my kids. You don't have time to sit down. Yeah. You don't have time to go to a $150 therapist. Right. Not an at hour. All. An hour. For an hour? Not $150? At all. Yeah. I can feed my family for a week for $150. <laughs> exactly, bro. <laughs> yeah. And that's why the system is so messed up, right? And so, like, you know, communities and people who do have to worry about getting by day to day, like, how are we supporting them on, like, a daily basis for that management, right? Like, I talk about a lot around, like, what it takes to just kind of live life, right? And it takes endurance, right? It takes, like, really great work, habit, work habits. And like the frontline workers and people in those, those situations, they're the hardest workers in the country, 1,000%, right? But they deserve an opportunity to rest and recover too. And so like how are you caring for yourself on a daily basis is ultimately what's most important too. And so like how are we democratizing access to like tools, resources, meditations, access to like mental health resources and therapists, et cetera, to make sure that, you know, even though like your situation may not change dr uh, drastically, like you still got to go out and bust your ass and fight tooth and claw to put food on the table, like you're recovering, you're restoring, and you're preparing so that you can do it the next day. Because the grind is real. Like if you keep grinding, 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 you're going to grind yourself to death, right? And that's why at the end of the day, our community is at an outsized risk for every chronic disease and illness in the book, right? Like, that's how we got there, right? Because we just kept grinding, 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 and we didn't have any the tools, the resources, et cetera, to really care for our minds and our bodies. We're having this conversation, right? And it almost feels like you have to be in this terrible place to check on yourself or right. to seek therapy. And, right. I, and I don't want it to be that stigma. I don't want it to be that, oh, you got to be going through all of these things. So in, in the way that you approach it, in the way that your, your company approaches it, Ryan, is, is, is it too about maintenance, right? Because you got to think about as football players, we had, to, we, had to, we had to do maintenance on our body, right? Even yeah. if you didn't, if the game wasn't even that hard on Sunday, you still got Both your treatment up. on Monday. Yeah. You still did, the, did these things. So it's, it's part of what you're doing and the approach that you're doing, you know, the videos and the ways that you're trying to kind of allow therapy to evolve into what people are into or what entertains or attracts people now. Is that part of it too? Getting our community to understand that, yeah, it's, it's okay to not be okay, but it's also okay to always be focused on yourself in that manner. Yeah, 1,000%. Like, right now, mental health is very reactive. Like, I only think about going to see a therapist uh, when something's wrong, or it's like the end of the rope. Like, man, I'm, I'm busting at the seams. I need, to I need help, right? And just like we are proactive around our physical health, whether that be for, like, a diet or going to the gym and nothing's necessarily wrong, but, you know, we, we're trying to get our hot girl or hot guy summer going to look good and feel good and being proactive in that manner, we need to take that same approach uh, with mental health as well. And so to your point, like, that's why we, like, took a big step back and said, like, what's the real issue here? Right, like the therapist's office, going to see a therapist, talked about like those access barriers, but it's right now it's a very binary proposition. Like, you know, there's Instagram where people are finding like comfort in memes and like, oh, like you saw me, I like this post and now I feel better about myself and I'm moving on with life. And then it, in between that, there's nothing. And then you go see a therapist and it's like, well, damn, I went from Instagram, now I gotta go see a therapist? Like, how can I be proactive? Mm -hmm. And so that's where like, I was very thoughtful and intentional about like, all right, like how do we kind of put something in the middle uh, between so, uh, social media, Instagram, and, and, uh, and the therapist's office to make sure that one, people are getting the help and support that they need, but ultimately helping them be proactive in their mental health too.
So I want to go left. Well, not even left, but I can't go left, right? Can't go. You can't go left, right? I don't know which way you going, buddy. I know, right? It's been, it's been a long day. It's been a long day. But listen, no, seriously. I, uh, this guy, he was a young guy by the time he got to Pittsburgh, one of your former teammates. People always talk about he has CTE, he's this, he's oh, that. I know, I know Antonio I Brown. Yeah. So this is my thing to you, because you, you had some experiences with him on the other side of the ball. Is he misunderstood mentally, or is he a mental mastermind? Is what he's doing premeditated? That, I'm not sure. Because everybody says yeah. he's CTE, and they call him crazy. Again, CTE is something that's diagnosed post-mortem. Right. Right? So, like, we can't make proclamations about somebody's mental state, particularly if they're not saying that they have an issue. Right? Like, well, we can... throw, throw that out. We, let's talk about just A.B., from what you know about A.B. What I and personally know about A.B.? What you personally know and have experienced about A.B., and this is for the outsiders, because they try and say, oh, he crazy, he losing it. I personally think it's all somewhat of a setup, and it's premeditated, and he knows what he's doing. More so than him losing his mind. I just don't think that. So, Fred, I'm before Monday answers, is this, are you speaking of just of the stuff that happened in football, or are you talking about two weeks ago saying, I don't feel sorry for you, Colin Kaepernick, or this throwing, week, throwing, or no, this week? Or throwing the gummy penises at his baby mama. You know, that I, part I, I, too. Okay. Yeah. There's a it's lot, a out lot, there. It's a lot of stories a lot out, out there. there now. Let's There's be honest. What, what, what I'm talking about mostly, right? We saw him walk off the field. We saw some other yeah. things. He just said racism doesn't exist. The whole thing, right? And we had him he on the show. He said racism doesn't exist? Yeah, he said, he said racism does not exist in America. Right, but we... we I'm going to thump his bottom lip. <laughs> I didn't hear that why, one. Why just the bottom lip, though? I'm going to just thump his bottom lip. <laughs> no, we had, we, had a, we had AB here on the show. Yeah, I see that. You know, it was, a, it was a, pretty, uh, it's a pretty good interview. We always yeah. allow the guests an opportunity to tell their story, and we try our best not to interrupt, right? And then we let... Everybody make their own, you know, assessment or whatever, post interview. But what I'm speaking uh, speaking to is, I personally like AB. I, I knew AB when he was. Same. He's always been a hard worker. I have very, very positive memories of AB. You know, and, and he he gets it and he grinds, right? So so from there, I think that what he's trying to do from his music career and everything that he's done, you know, since he left Pittsburgh. For me, I think it's premeditated. I don't think he's losing his mind from a mental health standpoint. I think he's sort of, he's well, planting seeds. That's what he's seeds. saying, too. He's saying nothing's wrong with me. I think he's right? planting seeds, and I got to respect that. Yeah. You know, but someone who understands from the angle that you've seen these things happen, Yeah. that was the reason I presented that question. No, that's a good question, right? Um, I go back to that framework I talked about, and the third piece is, like, what do you want? Right, so like, all right, based off of his actions, one could probably deduce like, all right, like you want to stay relevant, you want to stay in the news, you want to be famous, you want to continue to like live out this, uh, your your perception of like staying in the headlines, staying relevant, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's why you get all these buzzword buzzworthy headlines around Colin Kaepernick. Like, where's this coming from, right? That's where you ask yourself, and particularly again, like if he's saying nothing's wrong with him mentally. Okay, I'm gonna take you at that, but you're still acting this way, so I gotta figure out like, all right, well, what do you want? And it's probably somewhere around like just staying relevant, staying in the news, keeping your name atop a conversation, because reality is like people want that, right? Like people want to stay famous, they want to stay relevant, mm -hmm. and based off of that and what they want, you know, their actions will follow as such. And with alchemy, health, the mental side, you love it, and we said it half a dozen times already. The, the, this word, we said it half a dozen times, we just rolled past it. What does crazy mean? <laughs> what does crazy what mean? What does crazy mean? Because, cra like, you think about it, you say crazy, subjective. but this person is very subjective. You, this person is going through something, or is this person crazy? Because my kids called, like, we were in Jamaica, me and my wife and kids go to Jamaica, yeah. and uh, the, the, the drug addict on the corner, the dude out there screaming and yelling and looking at himself, they call him crazy man. But then they call AB crazy. People have called me crazy in college. Like, people, like, what does crazy mean? People called you that last week, too. People called me that yesterday. Yeah, so like, <laughs> don't act like that joke. Don't act like that joke's over. It, it, but it's, it's real talk. Like, what, like, for you to really be a part and really want to make a difference and really want to, like, 
yeah. get the mental, like what does crazy mean? Because there's people that are having problems and there's, there's people that are crazy. There's crazy people out there, Ryan. Yeah, for sure. I you think know what I'm saying? There's like mental health and mental illness, right? Like serious mental illness, like mm. bipolar, schizophrenia, et cetera. Um, and then there's like anxiety, depression, identity issues, and there's, there's like this whole spectrum. I don't think crazy is on that spectrum, but mm -hmm. it's a way to maybe describe somebody's actions in which, from an individual perspective, you don't think fit in the framework of like what is good human behavior. Yeah. And again, that's highly relative and subjective based off of like your upbringing, your experiences, but that is, that's a really good question to which I don't have an answer. Like how would one define crazy? But I think the reality is it, it always just seals down to like, what is your perception of crazy? Cause like your perception of somebody's actions and behaviors may be crazy, but somebody else would be like, oh, that's totally normal here, right? Yeah. And so I don't have like a strong answer for that, but something definitely to, to think about for sure. It's 2022. Words carry various meanings. They carry meaning. a lot of words. Yeah, right. Carry. You generally understand what like somebody says, oh, like you crazy, yeah. but do you, I, when you generally understand that, like how do you, I can't, I don't even have the language to articulate that right now, yeah. so like. No, it's, I, I, it's, it's I, I, funny, cause I, like, we'll joke about it, but people call me crazy all the time, the world, and I'm like. The world has got to a place though, too, where a lot of time, crazy comes along with, I disagree, mm -hmm. right? Or I don't behave that way, right? You know what I mean? Like, like you know, when, because people are different from what we think the norm is, then that person is quote unquote crazy to other people because their personality is different because of these because of the characteristics of normal yeah. as compared to other things and I think that's what like that's the the hard thing about mental health now is because like you truly don't know right. one folks lie like hell mm -hmm. right and two you can't diagnose yourself mm. you know what I mean like you don't like. It made me think about it when Ryan talked about the feelings will and saying that like good wasn't on it, right? A lot of times I say I'm good because I'm not bad, right? It's not, it's not necessarily that I'm in this great place, but like I'm all right, you know? Like I'm, I'm, I'm living, you know what I'm saying? I'm able to work, I'm able to provide and all of these different things. And so what I think I want you to do though, Ryan, because I was just, the whole time I'm thinking about Javon Belcher, I'm thinking about Junior Seau. I'm thinking about all of these players. The the, the C, that CTE was diagnosed post mortem, and ways that they could be comfortable. So I think what I what I would love for you to do, Ryan, as we close, is tell people about Alchemy Health. Tell them how they could get involved. Ways that they could find out information on it. Just so because the reason for bringing you here is not just to have the conversation, but to be able to point people in the right direction as well. Yeah, I appreciate that, bro. Um, at the end of the day, we're a tool and we're a resource, right? Like we talked about it a little bit before around like democratizing access. Getting help is really, really difficult, right? And a lot of times, uh, more times than not, people are suffering in silence. And we don't always know where to go, even if we're a millionaire or not, a frontline worker, we don't know where to go and how to get help, right? And particularly for folks who look like us, we really struggle because what matters a lot of times is finding somebody who looks like us mm -hmm. that will understand what we're going through and how we're going through it. And so, you know, Alchemy is designed around like starting that conversation, number one, and then number two, being readily available, whether it's 2 a.m. in the morning, whether it's 1 p.m., whether you want to get your meditation on at 8 a.m., you're taking a break right before you pick the kids up at 3 p.m., whatever it is, democratizing access is our core, 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 core cornerstone, right? Because of all the things I talked about before, the cost, the time, the geographic constraints, there's a therapist shortage in America, just generally, not just black therapists, but just generally, particularly after the last two years, mm -hmm. right? So like, again, Alchemy was designed to help people, to meet people where they are and to help them to get to where they wanna go uh, and democratizing that access. So you can check out our website, www.alchemyhealth.com, A-L-K-E-M-E, -E, uh, health.com, and, and, and start your journey today. And as I mentioned, right, like we are black centric and we will be black centric today, tomorrow, and forever, but we're available for everybody, right? Because again, I believe that the fundamental truth is that, um, you know, what's good for black people is good for all people. You brought up Junior Seau. And I remember when Junior went off that cliff, I didn't believe it. And mm -hmm. I called his phone, because I played with Junebug. Buddy. 
my buddy, I played with him. And I called his phone, and it didn't hit me until it went to voicemail. Mm. And it, like, that he was dead. You know what I'm saying? And it's one of the things that I think about, like, I, I look back, like, could I have done something? Like, I didn't see it. Like, we, we were together a month before that. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Like, we was hanging in Nashville for something silly. If there's somebody that you might think, and I didn't know Junebug was hurting like that. If there's somebody that you think's hurting or somebody that you think needs that, what would be the advice? Like, for me, now looking in retrospect, if I ever saw that at a, at a junior, what would you tell me to do to, to, that, to that man that if I saw the hurt that he was going through? Well, I think the interesting thing is a lot of times you don't even see the hurt, right? And we talked about, like, asking how you doing. You need to have somebody that you could really ask, like, how you doing, right? And you, can, you need to have that person uh, that you can really articulate and communicate, like, look, I'm not good. This is what actually is happening in my life, right? So the term that I use is like, find a you good buddy, right? Like, you know, that, that answer is just, it's just too, like, it rolls off the tongue too easy, right? Like, no, nah, I'm good. Like, no, nah, you're not good, man. Like, we need better language to really communicate how we're feeling. And even when you think that you have trust and when you have relationship with people, like, yo, that's my dog, and I still didn't know, right? Like, we gotta take a big step back and really understand, like, and I, I know it's frustrating, and I know it's disappointing, but like really just having those frank conversations of like, bro, you can talk to me, right? And reinforcing that. Like it, there's just way too much at stake for us not to do that and, and to walk around and live with that regret. So uh, the, the message would be to really like have those conversations, be upfront, and continue to be proactive around checking in on people uh, because you never know what somebody's going through. I think this conversation was, was much needed it also is, is good to have people that can navigate you around kind of your thoughts and your feelings. It's May, it's Mental Health Awareness Month. It's not only just about uh, being aware of what people are going through, but you know, working to understand, um, working to be sympathetic. And so what I would say is, you know, it's funny you mentioned how you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's a frontline worker, uh, the worker at Popeyes, uh, janitors, um, attorneys, players. Um, I think sometimes we ask how we, I know, I'm saying for me, I ask how you doing and I actually really don't listen to the answer. Mm. You know, and so I would think, you know, in, in this month, we should truly try to focus on asking people how they're doing and listening for the answer. And yeah. I think we also need to answer in a way that might say, you know what, I could use some help. So, man, we appreciate you, man. This is a, a very Thank impactful conversation. Yeah. I think it's going to be huge for the people uh, that watch our show, man. And, and it's good to see somebody who I always knew, Wonder Lick, who I always knew was, was extremely intelligent, finding yeah. a way he got a, You got a 29? 29. I got 29 32. I got a 32. He, made, he got 29 out of 29, though. Like I got a 32. Out, out of what, what, though? I don't give a f Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got a 32, hey. this nigga got a 29. This is the pivot. <laughs> <laughs> Limitless, nigga, stomach cow, pinning it. I father here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, get me up. Uh, on the mission, get me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, Limitless, nigga, stomach cow, pinning it. I father here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, Way I'm feeling, get me up. Uh, on the mission.